First of all, let me thank God for uh, grace um, this day to be in this particular space. Let me thank, thank uh, Representative Hall and the other officers who secured this room that we might have this first of its kind people's grand jury uh, addressing the issue of the denial of Medicaid to hundreds of thousands of North Carolinians and what we believe are some gross violations of our deepest uh, constitutional and moral principles. Uh, let me thank Scott Holmes and Irv Joyner, our team of lawyers uh, who will be carrying this out. They will do the introduction of others. Also, we, the inclement weather today has kept some people away, so I would like the media to know uh, because of that and because of the extensive amount of testimony uh, people that have asked to testify, we will be extending these proceedings uh, beyond today. Uh, we also chose today at noon to begin 12 to 4, but the next proceedings will be probably in the evening so that more people can come, uh, particularly those who may be working uh, during the course of today. Let me thank the witnesses who have come. Some of them have come under great difficulty. Some are, are, are actually themselves um, dealing with sicknesses. Let me thank the jurors, grand jurors who have come. I read this um, today, um, Scott and Irv. It said, our aim should be the same in both the state and the nation. That is to use the government as an efficient agency for the practical betterment of social and economic conditions throughout this land. That, that was not said 10 years ago. That was not said 30 years ago. That was not said 40 years or 50 years ago. That statement was actually made 103 years ago by a Republican named Teddy Roosevelt, who in August 6, 1912, launched the Bull Moose Party, but he launched it to challenge both Democrats and Republicans to move beyond partisanism and to do what was best for the people. And as a part of that speech, he listed several things that would be best. Number one, for the people to rule and not for high-priced lobbyists to rule the government. Number two, he said we ought to have Social Security. Number three, he said we ought to have a living wage as a matter of a moral and constitutional, uh, as matters of moral and constitutional issues. And number three, he said we ought to have national health care. 115, 103 years ago. And those words that he spoke, our aim should be to use government as an efficient agency for the practical betterment and social conditions throughout this land still apply today. So we began this session. We began it thinking about our deepest moral um, values because our laws are rooted in our Judeo-Christian, um, many ways, principles. And one of the greatest concerns in the Judeo-Christian uh, concept, and even in Islam, if you read it carefully, is that you're supposed to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and that you're supposed to care for the sick, and that when you have government power, it should be used for the uplift of all people. Finally, our own constitution that you will hear about today, we are dusting it off. The constitution in this state and in this country, the ours has been around 146 years, but it clearly says, it clearly says, that power is not supposed to be used to abuse the people, but power should be used to advance the hopes and the dreams and the possibility of the people. I believe this is the first of its kind, People's Assembly, anywhere in the nation, and I am glad that we can assemble on this day, um, uh, Professor Joyner, and I want to thank you for your leadership as our Legal Redress Chair, Scott, for coming. I also want to thank Dr. Rodney Sadler, who is our new uh, health chair for the, for the NAACP here in North Carolina and for the work that um, he has done uh, and will continue to do in this endeavor. Thank you so much. Let's move forward with this grand jury. We uh, gather here today as a uh, part of a people's assembly uh, and this uh, session is aimed at uh, naming and identifying the public harm that has been caused by the failure of our elected officials to hold sacred the lives of North Carolina residents. 
and specifically looking at the failure to expand health care coverage uh, in the uh, state, which has allowed any number of people to suffer and uh, die because of the absence of that med medical care. Uh, joining us today as uh, members of our grand jury, uh, who are seated to my right, uh, a distinguished panel, a diverse panel of citizens uh, in the uh, state and organizational representatives. Uh, Ricky uh, Liu, the Asian Pacific uh, Americans for uh, Progress, uh, Emma <coughs> Eggpan, uh, who is with uh, Planned Parenthood, um, South Atlantic region, uh, Barbara uh, Smalley McCann, who is with the Raleigh Apex NAACP, uh, Roar and Pula Memorial uh, Church, uh, Desmira Gatewood, who is with North Carolina Raise Up for 15, Jasmine Whaley, who is with Working America, part of the AFL-CIO, Curtis uh, Gatewood, who is uh, with the NC NAACP and is the uh, coordinator of the just recent uh, successful HK on J uh, coalition and demonstration, uh, Douglas Ryder, who is with the Veterans for Peace, uh, T.C. Rhodes, who is with the Unitarian Universalist uh, Fellowship of, uh, of Raleigh. Laurel Ashton, who is with the NC, uh, NAACP. Dave Herman, uh, who is uh, retired from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Gan Herman, who is uh, with the Church of Reconciliation, uh, Harold Richardson, who is with the uh, Fayetteville branch of the NAACP, and Vicki Ryder, who is a citizen and Moral Monday uh, witness. Uh, the, <clears throat> the first set of witnesses that we will have for you uh, today and um, uh, hopefully we will get to all of them uh, today. Uh, Leela Little, Leslie Boyd, Doug Douglas Johnston, Jason Williams, Willard Bass, Reverend Willard Bass, Rabbi Rick Hell, Jorovic, Reverend Rodney, Dr. Rodney Sadler Jr., Corey Jarrell, Barbara Johnson, Dr. Barbara Johnson, uh, Jarman Farrington, and Crystal Price, and Dr. Charles Vanderhurst. Uh, it is really a pleasure to convene uh, this event, which is being presided over by uh, the Honorable and former Mecklenburg County uh, Judge, uh, Resident Superior Court Judge, who has served for over 20 years in our courts uh, as, uh, as a judge in the Superior Court and the District Court. Prior to that, she served as an Assistant District Attorney in uh, Mecklenburg County. She has, uh, before uh, joining the bench, uh, an outstanding career as a uh, litigator and as a community leader in uh, Mecklenburg uh, County. Uh, Judge uh, Fulton, while on the bench, uh, led the court in developing a wide range of uh, uh, reforms and uh, advancement in the court uh, process. Uh, she developed a, a strategic plan, uh, successfully led campaigns in uh, Mecklenburg County for uh, bonds to uh, build the current uh, Mecklenburg County Courthouse, which is just a marvelous uh, site uh, to see and develop programs to address 
the needs of non-English speaking uh, citizens in the uh, court in the Mecklenburg County uh, court system. She has held court not only in Mecklenburg County but in other counties uh, as well. She served on the Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools Task Force. She is uh, has been a chair of the Board of Advisors for the uh, Charlotte School of Law, and she served as president of the Mecklenburg County uh, Bar. She presently is uh, a partner in the uh, law firm of 10 Fulton Walker and uh, Owens. Uh, she's continued her lifelong commitment to active leadership in community-based community -based programs as president of the Wesley Heights uh, Community Association, as the owner of the Wadsworth House, which is a meeting place for co corporate, civic, and social organizations and events uh, within uh, Charlotte. And we're certainly uh, appreciative uh, to her for being here with us today and agreeing to uh, preside over this uh, first uh, session of the uh, People's uh, Grand Jury. Uh, we're going to, first of all, start off, and this is by way of direction, uh, with uh, Judge Fulton calling the hearing uh, to order. Uh, we have, uh, we will then have an introduction of the uh, counsel uh, that will be uh, appearing and directing uh, the witnesses, uh, and then we will have the uh, witnesses who will come to testify from our witness chair here uh, next to the uh, to the judge. And then uh, by 2, 2.30 or so, we're going to go into a, a recess to uh, evaluate uh, the weather uh, situation and to determine whether the weather is going to allow us to, uh, to continue. My understanding is that it is on its way is on the uh, road, uh, but uh, the promise isn't going to keep us from going forward. It may uh, change uh, the order of our proceeding, but we're going to get started. So with that, I introduce you to or in, uh, to uh, Judge uh, Shirley Fulton. Thank you, Mr. Joyner. The court will now call this hearing to order, counsel. I am Scott Holmes. I am uh, here on behalf of the people. Um, ready to proceed? Yes, we're ready to proceed, Your Honor. You may call your first witness. Thank you, Judge. Um, we will call Leslie Boyd to the stand up here. Ms. Boyd, will you please state your full name? Leslie Boyd. And tell us a little bit about your background. Where are you from? Originally from Massachusetts. I now live in Asheville. Um, I was a newspaper reporter for 30 years, and I left that business uh, five years ago to start advocating for health care for everyone. And is there anything in your, your background or experience that led you into advocation for health care? Yes, the death of my son on April 1st, 2008 from cancer. Um, he was unable to get health insurance because a birth defect is a pre-existing condition. Uh, he was born with a fairly rare birth defect that left him very vulnerable to colon cancer. He needed colonoscopies every year, but because he couldn't get insurance, he couldn't get the colonoscopies. His physician actually wrote on his chart, patient needs a colonoscopy but can't afford it. I see a picture up next to you. Can you identify that for us? This is my son, Michael Danforth. Um, he was born on my 22nd birthday, November 3rd, 1974. And he, as I said, was born with a birth defect, which we kind of expected. Uh, I had a very rare virus when I was first pregnant, and the doctors advised me to have an abortion, and I would not. Tell us a little bit about your son. Mike was severely um, ADHD. He, by the time he was 16, um, he was severely depressed and self-medicating with alcohol and drugs. When he was 22, he sobered up, and from then on, um, he said that he prayed to God to help him stay sober, and if God helped him stay sober, he would chase drunks for the rest of his life. 
which meant he carried his home group's phone, the hotline. He, you could knock on his door at 2 o'clock in the morning. He was a, he was a chef, and he was also um, in college full time when he got sick. And you could knock on his door at 2 in the morning, and he would get up, and he would let you in, and he would brew coffee, and he would listen. Tell us a little bit about um, how healthcare um, and the, the, in, or the lack of um, insurance impacted his life. He um, went to the doctor. He had moved to Savannah, Georgia to go to college. And when he got there, he discovered that there was not a doctor in town who would bill him for the colonoscopy. Um, the one doctor who would do it would do it if he gave him $2,300 in cash, which, of course, my son did not have. And so my son kept trying to get care when he got sick. He went to the emergency room three different times, left with medications, a bill, and a misdiagnosis. Um, emergency rooms, contrary to what most people think, are required to take everyone and stabilize, not cure. They only have to find out, um, they only have to address the symptoms, not the root cause. And so he left with pain pills, he left with laxatives, he left with antibiotics and misdiagnoses. Nobody ever did a colonoscopy. Finally, um, when he had lost 30 pounds and he was down to 115 pounds, he was six feet tall and he weighed just 115 pounds. His physician did a colonoscopy, did not tell him that his colon was entirely blocked because he was poor. He didn't matter, I suppose. Um, but when he finally got, when he finally was admitted to the hospital, he was vomiting fecal matter and his organs were starting to shut down. He was hours from death. They did surgery. They diagnosed stage three colon cancer. And even though he had chemo and um, radiation, it wasn't enough to save his life. Six months after his, or seven months after his surgery, he had finished with chemo and radiation. And his small intestine developed um, a, a kink because of the radiation. This time they let him get down to 104 pounds and were still refusing to do anything until I said I was going to the media. Then they did something. But again, it was they found a few viable cancer cells, told him he was going to die, and then nobody came to see him in his, ho in his hospital room for the next 11 days that he was there. Nobody except nurses. One of the things we're going to uh, be talking about with various witnesses is the difference in care between folks who have insurance and folks who do not have insurance. And you've already said that, it, that you believe that they, your son received a different quality and kind of care. Absolutely. Can you, can you tell us in particular terms what you think he, he could have gotten if he was, had insurance and how that compared with what he actually received? When he was 25, they snipped the first precancerous polyp from his colon. If he had had um, quality care, he would have had a, a colonoscopy every year. He would still be with us. And he couldn't get the colonoscopy. And even when he got the colonoscopy, I think if he'd had insurance, the doctor would have said, you have a life-threatening condition. We need to treat it. Instead, he was sent home and nobody told him what was going on. Um, after his first surgery, um, I think he, the care probably would have been better. After a sec uh, before his second surgery, when he started getting sick again, he would have gotten care if he'd had insurance, but because he didn't have insurance, he didn't get the care. If he'd had insurance, I think a doctor, doctors would have come in to check on him in that 11 days post-surgery that he was in the hospital. If he'd had insurance, I think that the life-threatening infection in his incision would have been treated, but it wasn't. We got him a consult at Duke and um, Dr. Herb Hurwitz saw him and took one look at the incision and said, what does your surgeon say about this? And my son said, I'm healing slowly because I was malnourished. And Dr. Hurwitz said, yes, that and a life-threatening infection, and Duke will adopt you. But it was already too late. He had to leave his wife to get Medicaid. He had applied for disability. And he, he was still under consideration. It took 37 months to get approval. His first check came nine, da nine days after he died. He had no money, and he had to, he had to leave his wife. They, he could have been homeless had his best friend not taken him in. 
Is, do you have a message for um, the people who have the authority to make the decision to expand Medicaid as to whether or not that's a good or bad policy? It's excellent policy. When you think about, if you say that we can't afford to care for everyone, that's wrong. My son, if we had paid for a colonoscopy every year, probably would have cost us $60,000 over the course of his lifetime. Because we did not do that, his care cost almost a million dollars and he died. None of it is paid back by taxes because he's dead, he's not working. Your Honor, I don't have any further questions at this time, but it may be that panel members may have some follow-up questions. Panel members, do you have any questions of the witness? Yes, ma'am. Um, Leslie, when you first started talking about your son's death, and I'm so sorry. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that he was in Savannah. When, in the course of this um, long series of of um, failings on the part of our healthcare system for, for your son. Did he come back to North Carolina where he was dealing with North Carolina's Medicaid issues? He was um, a year in Savannah and then two years, a little over two years in North Carolina. Um, he did get the care he needed, but not through any effort of our government or um, our legislature. What he got was a single doctor whose heart was breaking because of the way my son had been treated. Um, the thing is, um, so many of these people who say that we can't expand Medicaid also call themselves pro-life. But before the Affordable Care Act took effect, 45,000 Americans died every year just the way my son did because they weren't good enough, because they didn't matter enough. And to me, you can't call yourself pro-life if you're good with that. And in North Carolina alone last year, up to, up to 2,800 people died for the same reason that my son died. And you can't call yourself pro-life if, you, if that's okay with you. Not in my book. Uh, no further questions. Thank you. Your Honor, at this time we'd like to call Crystal Price. Ms. Price, will you please tell us your name? It's Crystal Price. And can you tell us a little bit about your background? Um, like what? Well, where are you from? Greensboro, North Carolina. And how long have you lived there? 29 years. Um, do you have any work that you do in Greensboro? Um, I work in fast food. Okay, and how long have you done that? All together, uh, I was a manager for two years, and then when I went to Wendy's, I was just a crew member for six, six months. All right, and about how many hours a week do you work in fast food, or have you worked on average? Um, usually fast food, we get between 20 to 28 hours a week. Okay. And um, what's your educational background? Where did you, did you go to school? I went to Ben L. Smith High School. Okay. Um, at some point, have you had any difficulty in getting um, health insurance? Uh, I have. Um, I keep applying for Medicaid, and you have to wait 45 days, and then they just send me a paper that says I wasn't qualified. Doesn't have a specific reason, but it says I can appeal, so I keep appealing. 45 days later, still denied. And so you've been trying to get health care, is that right? In a way, I tried to sign up for Obamacare, but the lady, the representative I had talked to, when she was discussing the things that I might need, she said I would probably be paying about $155 a month for the Obamacare. Um, and with the bills that I have and children, and the little bit of money I was getting, I can't afford it. How many children do you have? I have two. And how old are they? Six and seven. And um, are, you, have you are you also trying to continue your education in any way? I would love to. Yeah, I would love to continue my education. So um, have you encountered any health problems in which require um, medical attention and insurance? Yes, sir. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your health situation? <clears throat> I 
I have cervical cancer. I also have cysts on my ovaries. When did you find out about that? Right after my son was born. And he's six. So this is something you've been living with for at least six years? Yes, sir. I want to thank you for your courage to um, come in public and share this with us um, and let you know that we really appreciate your willingness to share your story with us. Um, if at any time you need to take a break or you need um, tissues or water or anything, just please let us know. There's no rush. So um, tell us a little bit about the health care or the, what the doctors have told you about your situation? The best thing that I've heard was that I can get a full hysterectomy and that is probably going to be my best bet but without any health insurance the cheapest that I found is a little over $11,000 worth of surgery. I don't even make 10000 in a year so I definitely can afford that. Um, where do your children go to school? Wally Elementary. Um, and what grades are they? Kindergarten and first. Um, what are some of their interests? <laughs> My son, he loves, he, he loves sports. He wants to play football. My daughter wants to be on the Disney Channel. <laughs> she says she wants to be a Disney kid. <laughs> She's a princess? No, she just likes singing and dancing. <laughs> okay. Um, what support, if any, do you all have from family? We are each other's family. We support each other, that's it. I support my kids to the best of my ability, and <laughs> they are my biggest supporters. If I get sick, they already know. Um, my daughter will come up to me if I'm sick, and she'll be like, you want me to rub your tummy, mommy? <laughs> And so, we just support each other. Um, what support, if any, have you received from the state of North Carolina with respect to your medical situation? Um, like what? They don't do nothing. Have they provided you any um, uh, financial assistance in paying for your medical situation? <coughs> no. Um, have they provided you any emotional assistance for dealing with uh, uh, your serious illness? That's a joke, right? No. No, no there are places where that, that does happen. They haven't provided me with nothing. Um, when you when you have work at your job, have you did you have to fill out any um, forms? as a part of your work there to, when you started working there? Um, just the application and the tax forms. The tax forms? Yes. Um, and does that mean that the state of North Carolina is taking some taxes out of your paycheck? Yes, sir. And so you, um, you pay income taxes? Of course. Um, and when you buy things at the grocery, you pay sales tax, is that right? Yes, sir. Like everybody else? Um, how long have you been working at your current job? Um, I was working at Winnie's for six months. All right. And where did you work prior to that? Before that, I worked at a temp agency. Um, I also helped out at a tattoo shop, the convenience store, and being a housekeeper. All right. Um, I have no further questions. Members of the panel, in light of counselors' questions, do you have any questions at this point? There are two panel members that indicated they have questions. 
First of all, thank you. God bless you. Um, I wanted to ask you, do, do you have any recommendations to the state of North Carolina in a way? What do you feel would help you in your situation? As Are you familiar with the uh, Health Care Reform Act that was passed by President Obama and the fact that it was denied, the Medicaid coverage was denied by the state of North Carolina? Are you aware of that? You're talking about the Obamacare? Yes. And that it was denied by the state of North Carolina. Uh, did you have any recommendations for the state of North Carolina that you feel would help you uh, as far as health care and, and, and what, what the state could do to, to help you in your situation? I think if they would have expanded the Medicaid, then maybe others like me wouldn't have to actually just deal with the, the pain of being sick all the time. And also, the Obamacare was actually supposed to be helpful, but if we're not making enough money to afford it, then who's it really helping? And then now I find out that if I don't have it, any kind of insurance, I'm going to be, it's coming out of my taxes. So how is that even going to help? Now you're taking the money that I worked hard for away. Do you have any further questions, sir? Okay. Crystal, um, is your job aware of your condition? Yes, ma'am. So when you get sick, do you get paid time off, like sick leave? No, I stay in work. I can't afford to get a day off. Um, if I'm sick, I let them know that I'm not feeling good. They see it, but I still stay in work. Thank you. If North Carolina, Crystal, if North Carolina expanded, uh, Medicaid expansion went the route of Medicaid expansion, um, how would that affect the premiums that you would pay? You said you've tried on your own to get Obamacare, and it was 155 per month, which is out of the question. Tell us how uh, Medicaid expansion in the state of North Carolina would make that a possibility for you financially. When I had Medicaid before, um, even during my pregnancies, I had Medicaid. I didn't have to pay nothing towards my doctor's visits. It helped me a lot. Um, now that I have no Medicaid or no medical insurance at all, if I have to go to the hospital, the smallest bill I've had was $1,200, and that was just for them to come in there, check on me, and give me a prescription of pain pills, which I refuse to take the pain pills because it's not that kind of pain, and the pain pills aren't going to work and I don't want nothing that's going to go in my body to make me worse. So I think it would help if I had Medicaid because then I wouldn't have to, you know, be scared to go to the hospital. You know, I wouldn't have to stay at home and my kids would have to witness what I have to go through. I have one more question, Crystal. I know a lot of people in this state and in our nation think that if you are working as you are, that your employer would help you with health insurance. Can you speak to that and tell us why your employers are not helping you as they should? Um, that was actually the reason they cut our hours. If you work full time, they offer the health um, benefits. So in fast food, they actually cut the hours down and you cannot work any more than 28 hours a week. So that way they don't have to provide that for you. Um, I've done seeing, you know, CEOs speak up and say that that was the reason they cut their hours is they get to save more money by cutting our hours and getting us, you know, less pay, so, yeah. Any further questions from the panel members? Council? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, thank you. You may step down. Um, at this time, Your Honor, we'd like to call Ms. Little. Ms. Little? Um, please state your name. Lila Little. Thank you. Um, can you please tell us a little bit about your background? Yep. You can just leave it on. You don't have to hold it, I think. That's awesome. 
Um, I'm a registered nurse um, for the last 27 years. I am no longer able to work in that profession um, due to disability. Um, I live in Carborough and feel very passionately, um, not only because of the half a million people who are cut from Medicaid, but also from personal health problems. Um, um, where did you go, where did you get your nursing degree or certification? Um, a very obscure um, McNeese State University in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, and how long um, did you work as a nurse? 26 years. And what areas of nursing or medical care did you provide nursing care? Um, Post-op surgical, uh, emergency room, home care and hospice. Um, where, where have you worked in North Carolina, or what organizations have you worked with? Um, I worked um, with uh, Duke Medical. Um, I've done some uh, temp work at Central Prison um, and done some temporary assignments. I also worked at uh, Central Carolina in Sanford. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you are, have uh, um, an interest in um, this issue of provision of insurance, both um, from a policy perspective and a personal perspective. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your, your personal perspective? Sure. Um, I have a family history of heart disease, um, and I have a current diagnosis of congestive heart failure. Um, I'm also uh, currently being uh, worked up for a diagnosis of um, uterine cancer. And how long have you suffered from these um, diagnoses? Um, the congestive heart failure is several, several years old that I know of. Um, and the uh, uterine cancer is, uh, the, the possible cancer is very recent. Um, has there been anything in your past that has made it difficult for you to get insurance? Um, yes, I applied for disability uh, and is, it has been denied. Um, my family helps me cover expenses so I have no income. Because I am not blind or uh, visibly disabled, I do not qualify for Medicaid in North Carolina. Um, a lack of income is not a qualification in this state. I don't make enough money, I don't make any money, but I don't make the $11,400 for the ACA. Um, premiums. Given your experience in the medical profession, do you have an opinion about the difference of care folks get who have insurance versus those who do not? Oh, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your opinion and the basis for that opinion? Um, I have found um, and actually been directed to um, kind of put band-aids on things and send people home to have um, outpatient procedures done where they may have been done in-house uh, in a more timely manner. Um, I've had that done myself, had that done to myself as well. Let me understand what you're saying that f for folks who have insurance, um, they would, the doctors would recommend a different kind of care for people who have insurance or um, organizations would provide a different kind of care for people who have insurance or versus not or, or how does that work? I'm not sure that it's the doctors. I think that, that physicians and medical professionals um, 
honestly don't know what sort of insurance you've got. But I think the bed control people do, and they're the ones who run the ship. So if there is a bed available, um, I believe that that's going to um, be impacted by whether or not you have insurance. Can you think of a, any particular example, either in your experience or the experience of someone you have seen, where to help us understand better how that would actually play out in a specific situation? Sure. Um, two weeks ago, I visited the emergency room because I was having trouble breathing. I believed that it was related to my heart. So I went into that uh, emergency room and uh, they took a look at me, had some labs drawn. The numbers uh, for congestive heart failure were quite high. Um, I was told that they had been that high in the past, so that was not a problem for them. I should have an echocardiogram done, but I should have that done outpatient. It was a Sunday. There was no one to do the echo until a Monday. Instead of keeping me overnight, they sent me home to schedule that on my own. Um, outpatient echocardiograms in Chapel Hill run about $2,000. Um, out of pocket, that's just ridiculous. Um, and so, Naturally, I did not schedule one. Um, when I checked with my doctor, the number that they, that they said, oh, well, you've had that number before, the number was 6,000. Um, normal is 40 and below. They were com completely unconcerned with that high number they were not going to keep me overnight. They did not have bed space for that. Um, if you had gone, if you had scheduled the appointment in the outpatient, um, would they have treated you and figured out payment later or would they wanted to figure out payment first? Do you know how that works? Yes. Um, when you register for any sort of procedure, whether it's going into the emergency room or an outpatient procedure, the first person you meet is the person who wants your money. <laughs> they register you, they find out, they get consent for treatment, and they want to know how you're going to pay them. And they let you know, and there are actually signs there that say, payment expected before you leave here. So if you showed up for your echocardiogram at an outpatient clinic and said, look, I've got no insurance, I've got no money, the doctors say my number's off the chart, but I need to have that done here, can you please do it? What answer would you expect? I would have expected an answer of, um, you need to sit down with us and make a payment plan of how you're going to pay this. And they would have wanted a certain percentage up front. Now the folks back at the hospital, um, do they have any obligation to keep you overnight and give you the echocardiogram there? No. Why not? If you are not in a life-threatening situation, if you are what they consider stable, they have no, no obligation to, to keep you or treat you anymore. That's um, the law. At what point um, is it life-threatening if the number is 6,000 and, and the normal's 40? How do they decide what's life-threatening or not? Do you know? Um, I think if you're symptomatic and you, uh, you know, if you're swollen up and you, you know, you can't catch your breath, your lungs are full of fluid, um, you have to be put on a respirator, those sorts of things, that's, then they would keep you, yes. Are you aware of our, our state's decision not to expand Medicaid? Yes. 
You also mentioned that you had some ideas and opinions about the policy of this situation. Would you mind sharing those opinions and giving your basis? I think that to, um, to make a decision to save money on the one hand uh, by sacrificing lives on the other is not only bad policy, it's just bad humanity. Um, they're actually paying more money to keep people um, in ill health than they are to catch it early and, and do something proactive to that. Um, it looks good to the, uh, for their constituents, I suppose. Oh, look, we saved this much money. Um, whereas if you gathered those half a million people in one spot, I think that the rest of the state would be horrified to see that many people suffer. In your experience, is it more expensive to provide emergency care or preventative care? Oh, it's much more expensive to provide em emergency care, yes. And it sounds like, based on your testimony, emergency care is the only thing a person without insurance can expect to get at a hospital. Is that fair? Yes, and people wait until they are quite ill now. Um, they don't have a regular doctor, so the emergency room is their doctor. Um, they wait until their child has a fever of 103 or, um, you know, uh, until something is, is so awful that there's nowhere else they can go. Based on your own experiences and the experience of you, your work experience, do you have an opinion about whether or not having health insurance helps um, prolong lives and minimize suffering as compared to folks who don't have health insurance? Yes. And what is that opinion? Um, that the care provided, the equipment provided, um, and the frequency that those are provided are much improved. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. Questions from the members of the panel? Desmarie Gatewood. And I would like to know if you could share with us what has been the emotional impact of your journey with uterine cancer and not having health insurance on you? That's a journey that I'm just beginning. So um, I can tell you that it's frightening. I don't know, like this lady was speaking about, you know, an $11,000 bill. I think that's on the conservative side. Um, I have no idea how that that would be paid for. It's frightening. It's scary. Thank you. Any other members of the <coughs> Yes, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Douglas Ryder, and, and I want to thank you so much for the courage for coming here today <coughs> and sharing your story. What I'm hearing in that story is having two medical conditions that are untreated, you're having no money, having not been eligible for disability, that the only way that you're going to get treatment is if things worsen and you land up in the emergency department. Is it, does that sound correct? Yes. So um, I, I just want to say that that's a travesty of society that has an expectation and a responsibility to take care of our citizens. And I'm saddened to hear that, that we don't do that. And I, I just really want to honor the courage that you have to get up every morning and to walk the walk that you walk. Mm -hmm. And I'm out with that one. Barbara Smalley McMahon. Um, Miss Little, I'm, I'm curious and would like to know, they sent you home uh, with those 
of high alarming numbers when went in with uh, symptoms with congestive heart failure told you to come back the next day for an echocardiogram did you go back no so what happened um, they're still that high um, nothing's happened thank you mm -hmm. My name is Dale Herman. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about this, um, how a person gets admitted to a hospital? You say the doctor does not make that decision, that they're, they're bed counters somehow? I, I don't understand how that process works, how the decision sure. is made. Sure. Um, I don't mean to imply that the doctor does not make that decision. Um, it is their expertise that says this person is ill and they need a bed. Where the where it comes down to it though is that there there is a department, there is a person a person in in the um, hospital, every hospital, that is in charge of bed control. It's their decision who gets a bed when um, and where, depending on the information that the doctor gives them. Um, I do think they make the best decision they can under most circumstances. I also know that they look at a lot of different factors. Um, and. That's just the reality of it. Any follow-up questions? Um, Ms. Lowe, my name is Ricky Lung. Um, I wanted to ask, in your previous work as a nurse, um, do you have connections or um, friends or former coworkers uh, as doctors and nurses who either agree or disagree with the policies and what do they say? Have you spoken to any of them? You mean North Carolina's policies? Um, to be honest, um, not really. Um, the medical professionals I know um, they they want sick people to be treated. They want there to be no difference, um, no qualifier um, that you have to be have some uh, you know chronic or, or or terminal condition in order to qualify for medical care. Um, that's, I think, a uni pretty universal opinion among professionals I know. Yeah. Other questions from the panel? Let me follow up a little bit with you, ma'am. You mentioned something about a person in charge of debt control. Did you say that? Bed control. Bed control. Bed. Yes. And tell me how that works when you say in charge of bed control. Um, beds are a resource in a hospital, um, and they're limited, obviously. Um, if you have a 1,500-bed hospital, then there are only 1,500 people you can place. Um, and there are decisions made um, between physicians and, and the person running the show, so to speak. Um, think of them as a, a front desk clerk at a hotel. They assign the rooms, um, and it's their, that's their job to make certain that um, the sickest, um, hopefully, people are placed where they need to be. Is that decision made based on whether the person has insurance or not? 
that you would have to ask a bed control person. Um, I don't know that answer. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from council in light of my questions? Um, I have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, have you explored or are aware of any other potential options for you personally to receive health insurance? Um, because I have no um, income, they, uh, insurance companies like to get premiums. Uh, that's pretty much, uh, no. <laughs> I have no further questions, Your Honor. And at this time, let's hear from uh, Mr. Jason Williams, if you'd mind taking the stand. Mr. Williams, if you don't mind, please tell us your name and a little bit about where you're from. Sure, I'm Reverend Jason Williams. Um, currently live in the West Lincoln County part of our state, um, just outside of Lincoln to North Carolina. Um, where are you from originally? Actually from this area here, the Raleigh area, Fuqua Arena originally. Um, went away for school and came back to the state in uh, 2005 and have been in the Charlotte area since then. Where'd you go to school? Went to high school here in the state at Fuqua Arena High School. Um, went away to college at West Virginia University and um, then seminary in Richmond, Virginia, the Baptist Theological Seminary of Richmond. And since returning to North Carolina, how have you been employed? A uh, variety of ways making ends meet. I uh, moved to Charlotte, North Carolina to begin uh, a intentional Christian community uh, on the west side of Charlotte uh, with some friends at that time and spent about uh, almost a decade on the west side of Charlotte working with folks who were disproportionately affected by a variety of sectors and systems of our society, uh, predominantly a community of color there, um, and uh, was there about eight or nine years and have just recently sort of moved and branched out to rural North Carolina uh, having founded a new community there that are sort of looking at some of the same uh, issues of uh, inequity and marginalization that we looked at in urban uh, North Carolina for about eight years. So we've been there about a year and a half or two years now. Is it fair to say that you've lived in uh, communities that are struggling economically and have some experience living in those communities? For about a decade, yes. And uh, done work there with uh, nonprofits. I put food on my table by working with an organization in Charlotte, uh, formerly called Mecklenburg Ministries, now we're just MECMEN. We're kind of the interfaith network in Charlotte. Uh, and so I um, work part-time there to put food on my table. Um, my wife works at a local church in Charlotte and then we give the rest of our time to the communities that we live in. Um, do you have any other family in North Carolina? Yes, my, uh, my entire family's here. In fact, I've just been in Raleigh because my uh, grandmother's in the hospital right now, so my family's all from this area. So, can you tell us a little bit about um, your experience with folks in, in poverty or folks who are struggling economically and um, their effort to get health care? Yeah, so over the past decade I've worked with folks in a lot of different circles, a lot of different environments, um, who have struggled to to maintain some stability in their lifestyle for a variety of reasons, um, healthcare certainly being one of them. Uh, and perhaps maybe I can best kind of encapsulate that through uh, the story of one, one particular gentleman who kind of captures uh, sort of a framework of, of stories that happen, that I experience or watch or assist with on a regular basis. Um, uh, so a friend, uh, on the west side of Charlotte named Fred was um, struggled uh, with chronic unemployment for a long time and uh, had secured some work with uh, one of our local mail, mail carriers, uh, FedEx, for a while. Uh, he had become 
somewhat stable with this job. He was working part-time, so he didn't have access to benefits, uh, didn't have access to insurance uh, or, or many of the perks that sort of come with full-time work, uh, as you've heard some of our other uh, witnesses uh, discuss. Uh, Fred became ill at a point in time a few years after he had been working at this job, um, was having some walking problems, needed to go see the doctor. It, this has been something that had been going on in his life for a while. Um, he couldn't go to the doctor because not having insurance, wasn't able to afford it. Um, when things did get bad enough and you just have to go to the emergency room, that didn't provide the kind of uh, health and medication and whatnot that he needed. He couldn't afford any medication to deal with this problem. He has diabetes, and so uh, eventually things uh, became bad enough, excuse me, with his, uh, with his feet that he, couldn't, he wasn't able to walk. Uh, he he um, had to leave all of his work at, at the time went uh, into um, to get medical treatment at that time. Didn't really get it dealt with because he couldn't. Um, was at the point that he couldn't walk, so he couldn't work. We started the process of applying for disability. Um, he sort of got the bare bones uh, that he needed to get to try to qualify. That process took well over a year, probably upwards of two years, uh, to get qualified for disability. So now he is on disability and getting Medicaid because of disability and um, getting some care for his foot that was causing a problem. However, he's had to have an operation. He'll never be able to walk well again and he's basically will spend the rem remainder of his life uh, on disability uh, because of a, a condition that couldn't get treatment when he was working part-time and, and able to at least keep a roof over his head but not able to afford Medicare or, um, excuse me, medical care in the form of insurance or whatnot. So it sounds like as he was working, um, he had a medical condition that if tr was treatable at the time he was working. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah. You know, this the, what he had is something that many folks manage throughout their lives on a, on a regular basis through uh, medication or, or insulin or that kind of thing. So it's certainly something that could have been managed um, if he had had access to manage it at the time, but he wasn't able to, he didn't have the income that could afford medications or, or doctors and, or insurance at the time. So now he's essentially been pulled out of the workforce because of a condition that couldn't be treated um, at the time. So because he didn't have insurance, what was a treatable condition became a permanent disability. Is that what happened? That's exactly what happened. And. Um, where, whereas some kind of access, um, he made too much to, he worked too much to get Medicaid at the time, uh, but not enough to be able to afford any kind of other insurance on his own. And um, of course, this was this was mm, three or four or five years back. So um, he sort of fell into a gap there where he couldn't afford it, but um, he wasn't poor enough to get it. Um, and because he wasn't able to have access to any kind of, of care, yes, he's now permanently disabled, um, such to the point that he certainly can't do the kind of work that he did before and is right now struggling to find any kind of work that he can do. Yeah. If, the, if the goal of our, our society is to help people stay healthy and uh, part of the workforce, does it appear to you that this health care structure you've just described accomplishes that goal for people like Fred? Um, no, it doesn't. Uh, if the goal of our society were to be to have folks who can maintain, uh, who can be active and productive citizens, then it would seem to me that it's to our, um, it would behoove us, it would benefit us uh, both individually and collectively uh, to provide the kind of care and support for one another. Um, that would allow us to be good and productive citizens. So essentially what we've done uh, to Fred is not create a system whereby he can receive full-time employment or employment to the extent pay-wise that he can afford medical care or have access to medical care, um, yet we're content to uh, allow conditions to go untreated uh, such that now he's disabled and we will provide him medical care for the rest of his life. Um, through disability. Uh, in my opinion, if we had had a system uh, that sort of filled in that gap between the poverty line uh, and uh, above the poverty line, upwards to 150, 200% of it for everyone, uh, then Fred would have had 
insurance, they could have treated and maintained this particular condition, which is very treatable. Uh, many of probably those some of us in this room that have uh, diabetes right now that are managing it through medical care, uh, and he would be he would continue right now to be uh, able-bodied citizen who could function within our workforce. But because we didn't, he didn't have access to those kinds of things. Um, he is not now. He's disabled, most likely for the rest of his life. Have you uh, struggled over your work career to maintain insurance? I have. You know. Um, I am a, a member of local clergy in, in the Lincolnton area uh, and have been in the Charlotte area for a number of years, have given much of my time to the community to help folks that are in these exact situations, uh, having done a lot of that for um, sometimes peanuts and sometimes nothing, and um, trying to sort of put, uh, allow, allow outs work outside of, of that um, realm to pay for my basic expenses. So that's kind of put me living within about 150% of the poverty line for the past decade myself. Uh, so what is that income level, if you know, 150%? Uh, my wife and I, I have a wife uh, and two biological children and two, uh, one adopted son and one another uh, son who I was legal guardian for for a number of years. Um, so for most of the past decade, that's been a family of six, for a good five years, that was a family of six. Um, for a period of those times, I was able to get insurance for my two foster and adopted sons through the youth and family services in Charlotte. Um, but both of them aged out at one point. You know, when they turn 18, the system doesn't provide anything past 18. Uh, and so actually 2013, or excuse me, well, 2013, one of my older sons was um, aging out of that system and, and moving onto his own. So let me, let me pause. You asked me the, the, the number. So I have a family of six, and um, for most of the past three years, we've uh, hovered around uh, thirty to $35,000, which um, for a family that size keeps us kind of with around 150, well below 200% of the, of the poverty guideline. Um, so I paid in 2013 in insuring myself and my wife and my two daughters and my adopted son Kevin um, was paying well over 600 upwards of $700 to, um, for insurance a month. Um, in 2014 when the Affordable Care Act came into place, um, it was just a huge benefit to us. Um, I was very fortunate in the sense that I, I made enough that I, um, the federal system helped me out. So I got a, um, about a $500, $550 supplement that for the first time made insurance affordable for me. So different members of my family went for different periods of time with no insurance. Um, it was depending on the situation and who was most sick. but. Um, usually keeping it for my, my girls. Sometimes I would go without it uh, or my wife for a year if we had to do that. And then um, 2013, uh, because Kevin sort of aged out that year, he went for a number of months without it and we could not afford to put him onto our plan at the time. Um, the Affordable Care Act really helped because it allowed us to put Kevin onto our plan. Uh, our two girls, uh, because we were, we were over a certain income, were able to go onto uh, Medicaid and then the other three of us we were able to afford with this with the supplement we were able to afford insurance so it was the first so 2014 because of the Affordable Care Act uh, and because I made over a certain income uh, was the first year that I was able to to have insurance for my entire family and um, I think that that's the kind of thing particularly for a family who is who is committed to giving their life uh, to help the very issues that um, communities are struggling with uh, are, are receiving inequitable treatment through, um, it was a blessing to us. It really was. Um, um, you shared a lot of very important things with us in that just answer right there. And so I want to go back and have you explain a little more of some of the things you just said. Sure. First of all, it sounds like you are the father of two biological children and two adopted children. Is that what I just what you just said? Essentially, yes. One we adopted, the other we didn't know we could adopt, and so we're legal guardians for him now. Yeah. And so you are um, 
responsible for a family of six. Is that right? Both of, yeah, well, we have a family of six. Um, we've slowly nudged uh, the, the children that were adopted and became a legal guardian for uh, were both uh, young men from the neighborhood that we were living in and serving in. So um, they're both uh, children of color and their families uh, went through some difficult times and they found themselves in youth and family services in Charlotte and we already had a relationship with them so they um, allowed them to stay with us. So it is a complex relationship uh, but they are, let's see, one is uh, is about 22, 23 now, and so he's, we've slowly nudged him on his own, and then the other is still 19, just graduated from college or high school in August, and is very slowly working towards being on his own. So we're providing different levels of support for both of those young men. Well, you say that they allowed them to stay with you, but it's a pretty remarkable thing that you have done to take these young people into your life and your family. Um, and um, I just want to name that and thank you for that because sure. that is a uh, you're you're very gracious in the way you describe that as being something that you were allowed to do, but that is a tremendous, amazing thing that you are doing, and I want to name that and thank you for that. You also described what sounded like a, a horribly complicated effort to try to piece together health care for your family right up until 2014. That's right. And one of the phrases you used was that and you kind of had to laugh about because it's very difficult to talk about is had to figure out who was most sick. It was a phrase you kind of used to try to help figure out prioritization. Can you tell us a little bit more about the struggle you faced before the Affordable Care Act trying to piece together health care for your family? Yeah, um, you know we certainly wanted our kids to have it uh, because when they're in preschool and whatnot they um, there's just too much that they can get, but my wife and I were pretty healthy, so you know there were times where we had to make decisions over, okay, can we can we afford it for the children right now? Should we not have it for us since we're doing okay right now? Um, when Kevin turned 18, for example, he's our our sort of middle child, adopted son. Uh, he's 19, just having graduated high school. When he turned 18 in uh, 2013, he um, he uh, kind of in the middle of the year, or well, it was towards towards December. So we had to kind of make some decisions. Um, what do we do for this last month or two of the year? He's now lost his Medicaid uh, that he had through Youth and Family Services, um, which what is called adoption assistance. Uh, so it is a program that helps provide some assistance to families who have adopted teenagers, m mostly teenagers, uh, sort of later in their lives because it's such a hard age to find adoptive parents for. Um, that was uh, that adoption assistance was was a really big help. When he aged out of the system, he immediately lost access to that. So we were trying to figure out, okay, we there's no way we can afford it for these couple of months before the next something can kick in next to to pay for this. What do we do? Uh, do I get rid of it? Does Kevin? Do we just not get it for Kevin until we can find something that we can afford? Uh, which, fortunately, the Affordable Care Act was the only way that we were able to do that. And if it hadn't have been for that right now, um, several of us would probably be uninsured. Maybe the kids and not my wife and I, or something like that. So, um, you know, the the irony of all this was, uh, well, to me, some of the irony of it is. So, in due to a lot of situations that were going on in my life uh, in 2013. Um, we, we were able to start the uh, insurance through the healthcare.gov marketplace for 2014, and I found myself in the hospital in May of 2014 due to just an overwhelming amount of, of stress and, and burden that I was carrying. And if I hadn't had access to that um, insurance at the time, would have had not been covered for that period because we, I can assure you that we would have covered our kids over ourselves. So. Um, when I say it's a blessing, I mean literally. Uh, we would have been in big trouble. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, so you can pull me back if I'm rambling. Um, well, you are getting to my next question, which is the, describe for us the relief you feel now as a parent and um, uh, uh, a leader in your family uh, to have health care coverage for all the people that you care for. Yeah, it's a huge relief um, in a lot of ways, knowing knowing that we're not going to fall, not going to fall through the cracks. Um, certainly, 
um, to be able to provide the insurance for, for both my daughters, um, for our adopted son Kevin and for my wife at the time, now my wife. Um, it, it's also just a relief knowing that there is something in place now. Well, if I can be frank, I hear, I hear folks who walk these halls who have a, maybe a different persuasion than mine sometimes say the faith community needs to step up to the place and do more and the government shouldn't do it. And I want to look at them and say, I've, I can't, how do I step up to the plate more? My family's gone without insurance so that I am at the plate, uh, so that I am giving and trying to address these issues. I'm giving my time freely in many cases to help address these issues of inequity and disparity um, with respect to, to, to poverty, with respect to race. Um, and I can do that because I have some privilege. Don't get me wrong. I know that at the end of the day, if I fall down, I've got a family that's going to probably help pick me up, whereas a lot of folks don't. So I recognize that. Um, but I want to say to those folks, what, what else do you want me to do? I'm sacrificing my kid's education. I moved on to the, into the west side of Charlotte um, with, a, a, with, with a group of folks whom we committed to buy a house together, and now I can't sell that house. I'm upside down in it and, have, and just left with it. Um, I won't be able to, probably won't be able to send my kids to college because I'm giving so much. So now to know that there is a system in place that is recognizing that, hey, there's some of us that are giving a lot of our time and sacrificing um, a financial future in order to help the very situations that some legislators in North Carolina are saying the faith community should do more about, um, there's a system now that's helping me out, helping me do that. So I'm grateful for that. So when I say relief, it's not just a relief to have it, it's a relief to know that um, federally some folks are aware that there's a lot of folks making sacrifices and have stepped up to the plate to make that possible. You mentioned um, your adopted kids. Did, but prior to your adopting them, do you know whether or not any of them had difficulty or situations that arose as a result of not having health care that you feel comfortable sharing with us? Yeah, I didn't ask that question ahead of time, so I, I, I guess I'll be timid in some answers and maybe a little bit vague. Um, one thing that I can share is that um, Kevin, our now, I think I said 19 earlier, he's 20 now. Um, his mother, his family uh, existed on Medicaid for a while um, because they grandmother was, um, great grandmother was the primary caregiver um, and she was, um, she was on some assistance and so he did have uh, some care at the time for different periods of time. His mom um, receiving really poor quality treatment through hospitals because of the uh, health care access that she had or didn't have at the time. Um, had cancer and she passed away um, about a year after Kevin first came to us. Um, it's been a, you know, he already lost his family because they sort of separated ways. His grandmother was the primary, or great grandmother was the primary caregiver and she went into the hospital and just wasn't going to be able to take care of the family um, again. And so, which is partly why he sort of moved in with us and YFS and DSS gave their blessing on that. Um, he watched his mother pass away, literally went to the hospital, had no clue she had cancer, um, didn't have access to care, and she was gone within a few months of, a, of, of some conditions that maybe if she had had some access, I can't say for sure, but maybe she'd still be around. Maybe she would have lasted a little bit longer. So in, in light of losing his family situation, he also lost his mother um, within, all within a year, about a year of one another, this young man. So, you know, I just think about what could be if they had had better access to health care. Um, what would his grandmother, could she have gotten better care and be back at home with Kevin now? Um, could mom, would mom still be alive? Um, don't want to go into too many of those situations because I haven't asked permission, but uh, that's a little bit that I can share. Um, Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time, and we'll open the questions to panel members. Good afternoon. My name is Harold Richardson. Question, my question to you is, uh, you said as you walk the corridors here in uh, Raleigh and you hear conversations from the different legislators, 
asking what you as the faith community should be doing, my question to you is what, um, what do you feel, what sort of support you feel the government or the legislators should be giving to you as a taxpayer? Yeah, um, you know, I think that there are absolutely basic needs of life, that government is a social system, that we all band together, we the people, so to speak, um, and that it absolutely should provide some, some basic services, health care being one of them, absolutely. Um, I think as a person of faith that um, we're commanded to do so. I think it's part of our moral responsibility. I think it's part of our ethical uh, commitment to one another and to the communities that we're called to create for myself as a Christian. Um, and I think for a long time I, I, I may not have said that that way, uh, but I've certainly realized having gone through what I've gone through for the past 10 years uh, that uh, the government is a, a social system. It's our system of interacting, governing one another, organizing ourselves into communities uh, that live and survive and work and um, so, uh, for me, I'm at the point in my life where th this is absolutely necessary. Why, I, you know, and it, it doesn't make sense to me when I think about uh, we're certain, our, this is an example, businesses are required to provide health care or health insurance to folks who work full-time but not part-time. I don't see equity in that. Okay, um, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Please go ahead. Uh, my question also additionally to you and all the witnesses here today, uh, are you speaking directly to your representatives, letting them know? Absolutely. I've certainly been a, a, a part of movements here in North Carolina um, that are doing that. And as a person of faith in the communities that I live, I am speaking out. I, I work with a coalition uh, of systems in Charlotte called Race Matters for Juvenile Justice, where we are tackling these issues on a daily basis, trying to create better equity in the Charlotte-Mecklenburg school system, uh, trying to create um, uh, equity within law enforcement, within the court systems. Uh, we have a, a coalition of the Department of Social Services, Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, district court judges um, that are banding together to try to dr address these very kinds of issues. Uh, we're focusing on juveniles, of course, but um, yes. Yeah, on, again, on the issue of health care, what type of response are you getting back from them? Um, well, if I can paraphrase, I think the best response um, that I don't want to, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, but um, my brother Rodney Sadler was just in the newspaper in Charlotte, and he has a great relationship with one of our local senators in Cornelius, Jeff Tart, and um, I think Rodney's been very outspoken about his um, view of, of what the government should support. I uh, and provide as far as basic care goes. And um, Senator or, uh, Tart has said, uh, I appreciate that his heart's in the right place, but that's what the faith community um, should be doing. That's the work of the faith community. And to Senator Tart, I want to say, I am the faith community, and I'm sacrificing a whole heck of a lot to do it and can't even provide it all for my own family, and it's not enough. And it's in many ways, barely making a dent. I've been able to maybe make a dent for those two young men who are part of my family now, and frankly, they've got insurance because they've gotten it through access to my white skin and to the privilege that I have for my family. Um, but I, I don't know what it, I don't know what it would have happened without that. They got they're in a sense uh, reaping from some of that benefit, I guess, and I struggle with that because that brings in a lot more issues. But um. Ooh, I can get long-winded and go off course. Have I answered your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Uh, again, Barbara Smalley McMahon, Mr. Williams. Oh, I see you now. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your 19, 20-year-old son mm -hmm. and all of the losses he's gone through, his, his family to begin with, his grandmother and then his mother. Can you just talk some about what all of those multiple losses have been like for him? And also, were there other siblings, other family members who have also been impacted by that? Of other siblings and family members of him, of Kevin? Oh, goodness. That, that's more than I can probably get to today. Um, 
I, I can, his, he, his, he has very little access to most of his family right now. Of course, his mom passed away um, over, over her health. Um, his bro, he has a, a brother who um, is in and out of jail pretty regularly right now, this very moment. I'm not sure that I could tell you whether he's in or out. Um, he has another brother who has been incarcerated, who is, um, who is who's doing fairly well in Gastonia, North Carolina right now, and um, found a little bit more stability. He was incarcerated for a number of years uh, down in Charlotte. Um, his grandmother, we still see her. Uh, she's at a uh, fairly low-end facility in Charlotte, uh, nursing f uh, home facility in Charlotte, um, but is receiving some quality of care. I'll not comment on that more than to say that it's low. Um, and uh, so he sees her on some regular basis, and he has uh, some aunts and uncles that he sees uh, with some regularity. Some of them are, are in and out of um, incarceration themselves uh, and struggling to find stability. Um, what more questions do you have on that one? No, there's not another one. Thank you. Reverend, Reverend Williams, uh, Douglas Ryder. Um, just a quick question. There are approximately 37,000 veterans in North Carolina that would be eligible for Medicaid expansion mm -hmm. but haven't been approved by the legislature. I'm wondering, in the 10-year experience that you've had with individuals that you've dealt with who have been marginalized, if you've come across veterans and or families of veterans and what your opinion might be if they were eligible for this service that, that really uh, they are entitled to. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm really beginning to come into a relationship with many more people that fall in that category as I've been in, in the West Lincoln County area. So uh, we have a number of veterans in Lincoln County who are, are absolutely struggling. I mean, I, I could take the story that I described to you of Fred and I could apply it to many of these veterans uh, in Lincoln County right now um, who uh, have that sort of additional uh, piece to their life that they are veterans but still not getting the kind of access that they absolutely should deserve. Uh, deserve. So it is, um, it is very common. I have found that it's been more common in rural North Carolina than I have urban North Carolina, but that's just been my experience. I can't say much, much more than that. No further questions, and thank you very much for sharing with us today. Thank you. I, the next witness. Thank you, Judge. I, we'd like to call Ms. Farrington. Could you please tell us your name? My name is Jarman Farrington. And where are you from originally? Durham, North Carolina. And how long have you lived in Durham? All my life. And did you go to school in Durham when you were younger? Yes, I went to Hillside. All right. Um, and uh, where does your family live? My mother lives in Durham, North Carolina. She's uh, a nurse at Duke Hospital until she retired. My sister worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield. And um, do you have any children? No, I do not. And do you have uh, employment? Do you work? Yes, I do. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Well, I'm a CNA. I've been a CNA for 59 years. And, um, well, I was working in a rest home when I left because I was suffering from chronic migraines, so I left work. And my mom pays my insurance and my sister pays my health care for me because I can't afford it because I work as a, a nursing assistant at, at home health care. All right. Tell me a little bit of what a CNA is. A CNA is a certified nursing assistant who assists elder people in their homes who don't want to go to a rest home. So I go in their home and take care of them. And I help with their bath, help with their medication, help cook, clean their room with a keeping them safe from falling, you know, until somebody come home who can be there with them. What training have you had to receive in order to be a CNA? I went to school to get certified. Well, <laughs> it's kind of funny because my aunt got sick, and when I was little, 
She always took care of me when I was sick. So I was going to turn the favor. And she said, no, if you want to do this, go back to school, which I have never thought about doing that. So this was, <laughs> she said, that's what I was born to do is to help others. So I get a joy out and help other people that I can. If I meet a stranger on the street, if I can help you, I help you. If I can't, I can't. And so after you received this training, you were able to go help your aunt, is that right? She still wouldn't let me help her. <laughs> she still wouldn't let me help her. So then it was like four sisters, you know, all of them had all timers. They, you know, I'm mama. Um, mama, can I have cookies? If I say, no, you can't have no cookies today, but you can eat this food. And they wouldn't eat, but I knew they had to take their medicine. So I said, well, if you eat this food right here, I promise you I'll give some cookies and ice cream. So they would eat. And at nighttime, I would have to put something to the, the door because they would wander off at night. You know, or either they'd be up trying to cook. So I had to take all the knives off the stove, hide the knives, and they'll come in and say, Ma, you know, it's time to eat. I'm like, you know, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. You need to go to bed, <laughs> you know. So I had two of them with night syndromes, two of them with day syndromes. The one at night, stay up all night. The one during the day, slept all during the day. So it was a constant challenge for me to help them out to figure out what they want. But I was their mother, so I took care of them until they passed away. At, do you have some experience with trying to get health insurance and get medical coverage for you and your family? Well, I do. My mom and my sister don't because my sister went for Blue Cross Blue Shield, so she automatically get health insurance. Um, my mom, she retired from Duke Hospital as a nurse, so they can afford it, I can't. So between my mom and my sister, they make sure I get um, insurance because I suffer from chronic migraines. I have high blood pressure. I have diabetes. So they make sure I'm all right because they always say, you always take care of everybody else. Nobody don't take care of you. So they take care of me. And I feel bad because I don't want nobody to take care of me. I want to take care of me. You know, I want to do for me. You know, because that's what I feel like I'm supposed to do is take care of the people in my household and the people who are around me that I care about. You know, if, if I had insurance, I wouldn't have to stay. <laughs> I wouldn't let my mama take care of me. My mama's like 79 years old. What is she doing taking care of me? I am 59 years old. I sh my mother should not have to take care of me. I should be able to take care of my mama, you know, because she don't took care of me all her life. My mama was a single mother. I see my mama go to school, become a nurse. I see my mama walk to work and scuffle them so we can have and I could tell anybody I had a mother because my mother, I didn't never worry about where my next meal was coming from. I didn't never worry about the lights getting cut off or this. If it was a trip at school, my mom paid for it. It's time for my mom to sit down and don't worry about me. It's me for me to worry about her. Why are you having difficulty getting insurance? I don't, make, I don't make enough money because I work in a health care in home health care and I go to work um, in the morning and I only make eight dollars an hour. I can't afford to pay insurance. I have to pay like my mom take care of my insurance like if I go to the doctor but the insurance only cover half of like my medication. I still had to come out of my pockets with seventy nine dollars which she's not, like I got that. You know, she would pay it if I would say, well, I don't have the money to get my medicine today. She would pay it. 
But why should she have to pay it? So it sounds like you work in the healthcare profession taking care of people, but you don't make enough money to afford your own health care. Is that right? That's right. I mean, you can go and try. I mean, you can go and see, can you live off of eight dollars an hour, and you have a medical condition, and you can't afford to pay your for insurance, or you got to pay for medicine. You don't have enough money to do that. I don't have enough money to get my own apartment. I don't have enough money to pay a light bill or water bill. And I don't want to stay home with my mama. Don't get me wrong. Lord knows don't get me wrong. I love my mama to death. But I am too old to be in my mama's house. You know, that is not. I always learned like this when I was coming up. God bless the child to have his own. And I want my own. And I'm scuffing right now. And I ain't proud of the situation I'm in. It's the way it is. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. I would ask the panel if, if they have any. Desmar Gatewood, the home care agency you work for, who do they get their money from? Um, Medicaid and Medicare. So Medicaid and Medicare gives your home care agency money? Yeah. Okay. My next question is, if your mother is out of the picture, have you thought about how you're going to have health insurance? Hmm. Uh, I thought about it. Well, no, not really, because I can go to Lincoln Hospital and get, because I don't have a job. So Lincoln offer free service, but they don't cover that if I would get like real, real, real sick and had to go to the emergency room. Like she, one of the um, ladies said, you go to the emergency room, if you not dying, they ain't gonna run no test. If you was like dying, halfway dead, they run the test that you need to be done at that point of time. But if I'm just going for like real bad headaches, can't see. Sometimes I get real bad headaches. I can't see. You know, I, I get totally blind. That's how bad the headaches be. If I would go there, they would leave me in the emergency room, hook me up to some IV until in the morning, until I go through that stage of the pain. You know, they would have to put me in what they call a deuce coma because the pains be so bad that I can't deal with it so the last question is if god forbid something were to happen to your mother today you would not have a way to pay for health insurance correct nope i just be lost you know i wouldn't <laughs> oh jesus be everything had my mom i wouldn't i couldn't make it i could stay in her house it's paid for but still if I live there in her house that she done paid for, it's still saying that that's hers. God, is she gone, it's still her house. And I got to take the little money I do get, that's still like being what be. I still ain't going to be able to afford um, health care. So I don't know what, what I would do if my mom would pass and my sister would be gone. I wouldn't know what, what I would do without health care insurance. You know, every time I would get sick, I would just have to go to the doctor, get me some medicine through the emergency room, and hope and pray that when I get the bill, that somehow I have enough money to pay a dollar here, a dollar there for the bill. Thank you, Jarman. <laughs> to the witness, um, you work full time for the moment. No, I don't work, work. full time. I work part time. You work part time. Mm -hmm. But even at part time, you make you said what an hour? I I work four hours a day, seven days a week. Okay. okay. And and if in fact, have you thought about this Medicaid expansion in in the state? Medicaid expansion would that helpful to you? If they would expand it, and I can find a um a good enough job to pay my own insurance, yeah. I thought about it. If they need to spend it, yeah. 
What if what if Medicaid expansion was to pay for you? In other words, if you work like you work now, uh -huh. and Medicaid was expanded, uh -huh. and you would be able to receive free health care, um, how would that benefit? How would you feel about being able to have your own health care through Medicaid expansion? I would love it because then I won't have that worry where somehow I'm going to pay for this and how I'm going to pay for this medicine, you know. I mean, then it's there. I don't have to worry about, Lord Jesus, where is I going to get How am I going to pay for this medicine? How is I going to pay for this uh, MIR or, or, or whatever I need to be done, you know. I, they will pay for that. That's, that's my last worry. That can concentrate on other things, on other hands that need to be done. One follow up, despite the fact that you mentioned that you had high blood pressure and diabetes, your desire is to work. You love work, do you? I love to work. I love to work. I mean, I love to work. I love to take care of people, you know. It, I mean, when, we, when people get old, you, they have stories. And I love to go into an other person's home because they have stories that you have never heard. And it is so amazing what our elders can teach us. You know, if without them, they wouldn't be us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. No further questions. Okay. Um, Judge, at this time, it appears that the, the weather is upon us, um, and if I may, I'd like to make a few closing remarks for the court and the panel to give the, the court and the panel an idea of where we'll be headed next. Okay. We've heard a little bit today about the failure to expand Medicaid. Um, and ladies and gentlemen of the panel, you've heard some stories about people who have been impacted by the failure to have insurance. You've heard the importance of insurance um, to the outcomes of lives of people who have been before you. And we have other evidence for you to consider that we're not able to present today because of the weather and because um, it's a lot of evidence. The evidence that I hope to bring to you um, next Monday, if we can reconvene, or our Monday after that, would be evidence from experts um, who understand the economics of Medicaid, um, testimony from doctors who provide care for people in the gap and out of the gap, um, from policy studies from other states including a recent study in Kentucky that found that they're actually making money, more money than is necessary to make the ma matching funds. And so it is our hope that we can bring to you that evidence and then bring to you also our Constitution, which reads in Article 11, Section 4, that beneficent to the poor, the unfortunate, and the orphan is one of the first duties of a civilized and Christian state. And therefore, the General Assembly shall provide for and define the duties of the public welfare. And within our own constitution, there is a mandate to take care of the poor that we are not um, living up to even remotely. There's another provision, Article 1, Section 2, that says that all political power is vested and derived from the people and that the government of right originates from the people is founded upon their will only and is instituted solely for the good of the whole. And we've heard today that there's a whole part of our community that we're not caring for and that there are the resources are there, the, the money is there, the, the people are there, the only thing keeping us from taking care of these folks is our own lack of will. And so after we hear the evidence, we're going to ask you as the attorneys to return a, an indictment, an indictment that says that our governor, 
our Speaker of the House, our President Pro Temp, and all our legislators who are opposing this expansion of Medicaid are acting in violation of the North Carolina Constitution, that their behavior exhibits a reckless and careless disregard for the consequences of their acts, and the heedless indifference to the rights, the safety, and the health of North Carolinians. And we're going to ask you to return that true bill, but not until you've heard all of this evidence and you've heard from people who are seated here today and who we are going to call before you at a later date. I want to thank you all for your, your time. I want to thank you, Judge Fulton, for coming and presiding. But I want to particularly thank your witnesses who have taken time out of your lives to come to this place, our General Assembly, to this People's General Assembly, to be heard and made your voices heard and help us build this record that is necessary for us to move forward as a state to really take care of the whole. Um, I have no further remarks, but maybe um, Reverend Barber or Mr. Professor Joyner may like to close for us. I want to thank the attorneys for convening this. We have a number of people who could not be here today uh, due to the inclement weather. Uh, we will be trying to convene on next Monday, and hopefully it will may, may even be later in the evening. But again, thank you to all of the witnesses. Your stories are both triumphant and troubling. Uh, they are triumphant in the way in which you have met tremendous difficulties, even in the face of great obstacles from your own government. But they're also troubling because you represent we the people and the good of the whole. And it's troubling that we would see uh, the kind of reckless abandonment of our constitutional principles uh, here in North Carolina, but we believe we can do better and we will do better. And one of the things, your faces, your story, move this away from just being numbers to really being about people. And thank you for the willingness to put your face on the line that transformation might come because you have said looking North Carolina straight in its eyes. It's not just a vote anymore in a committee room. It's literally about the lives of real people of all different races, creeds, colors, class, and sexualities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Members of the panel, we are going to adjourn due to inclement weather. Um, thank you all for coming today. And um, we are adjourned until further notice. Thank you.